Hello, my name's Ed Struzik. I've worked for the Edmonton Journal for 30 years, and much of that time I've spent in the Arctic. In 2009, I was awarded the Michener Deacon Fellowship, which is given to one journalist each year to work on an issue of national significance. The issue I proposed to look at was Canada's sovereignty over the Arctic and all the questions that re revolved around that. It's a hot topic of debate now that the world has woken up to the fact that there are tremendous resources to be found in this icy world. The first stop on my journey around the Arctic was on the sea ice near Bar Borden Island where Canadian scientists are helping the government stake its claim on a huge region around the North Pole. If they're successful in proving that a good part of that unclaimed region is attached to Canada's continental shelf, the map of the country will be redrawn in a very significant way. We stand to add territory that is equal to, to the size of the three prairie provinces. Borden Island is a remote, uninhabited island that lies at the outer edge of the Arch Arctic Archipelago. It took me three days and several plane rides to get there. I was lucky because several scientists waited for weeks for the weather to clear. One of them had been delayed for so long that he got to visit for only 45 minutes so that he could catch his plane back home. When I visited in early April, the temperatures hovered around the minus 27 degree mark. And as you can see here from the pictures, the place is little more than a tent camp. Uh, space was so tight that there were three half-hour shifts to eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Many of the scientists worked 18-hour days, so there was little opportunity to relax or get some exercise. Those who did have a little extra time would occasionally go for a walk on the sea ice. The only condition was that they carry a rifle just in case there were polar bears in the region. To minimize the possibility of polar bear confrontations, two Inuit men were hired to patrol the perimeters of the camp. Ironically, Tommy and Joby Kikaktuk were from Greece Fjord on Ellesmere Island. Most of the Inuit residents of that small community were shipped there in 1953 to help Canada assert its sovereignty over the area. It's been a sore point for many of them ever since. Scientists at Borden Island had several devices to help them map the ocean floor. The most common was a device that sends pulses through the ice that give them a picture of what the ocean floor looks like. The most exciting was an unmanned submersible that was designed to travel under the ice. In this case, scientists with the Defense Research and Development Canada planned to send it along a 350 kilometer journey from Borden Island to another camp that had been set up further north. Once it got there, it would be sent on several more missions. In order to do this, they needed to move 30 tons of ice to launch it. They also had to drill holes around the perimeters of both camps so they could lower devices that would help guide the submersible on its return. Doing this is not easy, especially when you consider that the remote camp was sitting on ice that was constantly being moved by ocean currents. That submersible may be extremely intelligent thanks to computer programmers who helped design it, but it required additional help to get it exactly to the hole. Here you can see Mark Rosum of Defense Research and Development Canada using an ROV and a computer to try to hook onto it. While the submersible was on its trial run, we would occasionally be visited by one or two seals that uh, were denning in the area, and they became so tame that they would just sit there and look at us for the longest time. And funny enough, uh, each time that uh, Tommy and Joby would come in, of course, being expert seal hunters, this uh, seal would uh, disappear as fast as it could. Uh, when it came time to launch the submersible on its 100 kilometer run, everybody had assumed and was pretty confident that all the glitches had been worked out. But then things started uh, getting a little bit tricky. First, uh, the weather came in and prevented three of the scientists from going to the halfway point to see if it got there. And then when it was uh, supposed to return, it didn't show up. And that's when everybody got into a sort of an emergency planning mode. Uh, you know, what to do uh, if the $2.5 million submersible didn't come back. One of the options was to deploy one of the four helicopters on site uh, with scientists on board and drill holes in the ice along the way to home in on it. Uh, 
That, of course, was tricky that night during the twilight hours, but then you can also imagine if they did find, manage to find it the next day, say 50 kilometers away, uh, how would you get it out of the ice? Would you have to send out another crew and drill uh, uh, more holes and move 30 tons of ice? Uh, of course, everybody was uh, starting to get very, very concerned, and uh, uh, the options, of course, were limited, and people were planning for the worst. Uh, but then at the very last minute, uh, someone heard uh, the distinctive electronic chirping of the submersible, and uh, they knew that at that point it was coming in. And as it turned out, what had happened was that a computer glitch had uh, essentially underestimated the distance it had traveled, and uh, it took a lot longer for it to get to where it was going and come back. In the end, it was a tremendous success. Uh, it didn't get to uh, deploy as many missions as uh, the scientists hoped because weather had uh, prevented uh, them deploying two of the submersibles, but uh, still it set a world record for travel under ice and Canadian scientists in this case uh, were responsible for it. And now we are one step closer to claiming a huge area around the North Geographic Pole.